your uh, host uh, for this evening. We have a presenter, a special presenter, uh, Tony from uh, Tony Caters will be doing our, our special presentation today. Uh, really quick, I have a couple of household housekeeping items I'd like to go through with you. First and foremost, we're gonna record this event. Um, we do that for a lot of reasons, but number one, to make it available to those who could not be here this evening. Um, second, your microphones will be muted when you first join the Zoom. Um, however, if you have questions or um, you, you would like to show us your, what you're creating to make sure it's going well, um, you can just either raise your hand in the uh, Zoom, uh, the functions that you have there at the bottom, or you can just type into the chat room uh, your question and we will get to you as soon as we can. Um, this hands-on members cooking night is real, it's actually our second uh, members event, online members event that we've had. Um, and if you were unable to make the first one, just let us know and we can forward you or send you uh, the link the, for that Zoom recording. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this, just a quick reminder, once again, this is being recorded. Um, and if you brought your ingredients, awesome, that's great. Um, you can do this right along with Tony as he is prepping and uh, cooking. However, if you, you didn't get your ingredients or you, you didn't have it, no worries. Please just follow along with us as we're doing this. Um, we uh, want to formally introduce you to Tony Santos. Tony is the executive chef and owner of Tony Caters. Tony actually runs the Tech Cafe and has been doing it for the past few years. He is uh, a South Bay Area, San Jose, born and raised. He's been here his whole life. Um, he graduated from Santa Clara University with a degree in technology public relations. Uh, before switching gears in 2005 uh, and graduating from the California Culinary School and Entrepreneurship Program. Without uh, further uh, pomp and circumstance, I'm actually going to hand it right over to Tony Santos. Nice. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, hope everyone's doing well. I'm really glad to be part of this event. Um, the tech is a really special place for me. Uh, Talents didn't mention I thought he might. Um, I uh, actually worked at the tech. Uh, for a number of years uh, in public relations. It was my last uh, PR job uh, before uh, deciding to go down this road of uh, entrepreneurialism and starting my business. So the tech is a very, very special place for me. Uh, I have a lot of history there. My wife and I actually met working at the tech. Uh, so just a really special place. So I'm uh, really glad to, to be part of this event and to have the relationship that, that Tony Caters has. Um, I think you guys can see on the screen. So if you wanna check us out on the web, uh, TonyCaters to you.com and we're at Tony Caters on all the social so feel free to follow us uh, we're, we're um, you know pivoting in a lot of unique ways right now with everything that's going on so there's a lot of fun stuff to check out uh, that we're up to it's uh, I, <laughs> I always say never a dull moment at Tony Caters uh, try as we might <laughs> try as we might there's never a dull moment for sure um, I, I wanted to dovetail on one of the things that talent said so um, you know I hope that you got ingredients and that you want to do this with us and we I would love nothing more than to sort of break this up and check in on what you guys are doing, give you my tips and tricks. Um, but if you don't have the ingredients, I feel really strongly that um, you can just sort of, you know, watch us sort of make our way through this and it's something for you uh, for later. Um, some of the things that I wanna show you tonight are, uh, you know, I certainly wanna have fun, right? That we can have fun doing this activity in the moment. And obviously this will hopefully, this will culminate in your dinner. Uh, but I really want, um, to give you some tips and tricks, whether you do this activity tomorrow or whether you just sort of get more adventurous with cooking. Um, I wanna give you some tips and tricks that you can use moving forward just in general. Um, and I also, um, I, I just, you know, cooking doesn't have to be scary or intimidating or overwhelming. Um, you know, I, I shared precise um, measurements for the vinaigrette that we're gonna be making later. So we're gonna do, we're gonna go through some technique and then we're gonna get um, a flatbread in the oven and then we're gonna focus on this vinaigrette if you wanted to accompany this with a salad. Um, I shared some specific measurements, but, um, and I'm, to be honest with you, I'm always surprised when people are so, um, you know, feel like everything has to be as precise as baking. And it's like, no, you said a quarter teaspoon, no, you said one tablespoon, uh, you know, especially when it's at your home. I mean, you're, I don't think you're gonna sell any of this to, <laughs> to your community, right? Uh, after this, like, like I do, um, you know, do it to your taste, be relaxed about it. Um, I always say we win. The food doesn't win, we win. Just it's it's going to be fine. So uh, I, I hope this gives you a little more confidence and, and some instills some confidence and you can have some fun in your kitchen forward. 
So uh, if you can advance to the next slide, I wanted to give you kind of a lay of the land, like what's the plan? Uh, so kind of running through this equipment list and then we're gonna move into the demos. Uh, like I said, we're gonna do a flatbread and then we're gonna focus on this vinaigrette that you can pair with a salad. And to be honest with you, uh, I'm gonna show you something really alternative that you could do with the pizza dough. Um, and it's, to be, you know, vinaigrette doesn't have to be for salad, right? It could be uh, used in a lot of different ways. So um, the vinaigrette that we'll make later, um, you might use with the alternative. Talents keep me honest to remember to show them the alternative because I have a lot of stuff behind me. So um, we'll show them that alternative where they could use that vinaigrette. Uh, but we're going to do a lot of demos as we as we build towards getting the flatbread in the oven. And so the first thing we're going to focus on toppings. So we're going to talk about chopping and mincing. Um, I'm actually going to do onions first so that we can get onions caramelizing. Um, generally, you would caramelize onions very low and slow for like 45 minutes to an hour. If you want that really kind of like almost like jammy kind of caramelized onion consistency. Um, we're not going to have that that kind of time because we are going to get, get the flatbread in the oven. So by the time I get these um, these onions off, they'll be more kind of like a slow kind of saute, but you could certainly leave them longer um, online or um, on the, online on the stove. So I'm going to get my oven or my stove top started. So we'll get into chopping those onions and then we're going to go into mincing garlic. We're going to caramelize those onions. I'm going to talk about infusing oils. I actually infused one already, but I'll just talk through that process. Um, and then the flatbread. So we're going to we're going to roll the flatbread, top it. And a big thing, I think this is really overwhelming for people, that idea especially when it's loaded up with toppings of transferring it into your oven. I have a couple of tricks uh, to make it easier for you to, for you to transfer the flatbread off of your uh, cutting board or you know, people use those big like pizza peel spatula things. Um, so we'll get some tricks there. And then we'll go into the vinaigrette, which I think is a really, you know, it's just kind of like a base technique that you can take in a lot of different ways and a lot of different flavors. And then if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is my last slide. Uh, what do you need? Um, you know, open mind and imagination, of course, and a lot of other sort of little ingredients, whatever ingredients you have. Uh, but what you're really going to need uh, is some towels. So I have a towel. I'm going to show you some tricks with this towel later. Um, and then uh, for purposes of the flatbread and the toppings, we're going to need a rolling pin, of course, um, a knife. Uh, that's actually, in case anyone's curious, this actually is the knife I recommend. I think that's an eight inch uh, chef's knife from Global. Uh, I love it. Uh, these are fairly expensive. Um, I think, well, maybe not on the spectrum of knives, but it's, yeah, it's a little, I don't know, it's not cheap. Um, I love this knife because it's super lightweight. Um, it doesn't have that thick sort of spine. The spine is actually fairly thin. It's kind of easy to control. And I'll show you once we're getting into it with the herbs, um, you can either sort of hold it like this, or you can actually choke right up on it, depending on what you're working on. I'll hold it closer. Um, I love this knife. That happens to be the same image that, that I pulled up there. Uh, and then, and then the board, of course, and then that big pile of flour. So you'll, we'll talk a lot about this when we get into rolling the flatbread. Um, I'm a, a real big advocate for, uh, it, you know, if a little's good, more is better when it comes to the bench flour. Uh, and then we'll talk actually about cornmeal. We use cornmeal, cornmeal later to transfer um, into the oven. Uh, you really do not, you know, you have a lot going on. You don't want to be sort of fighting the sticking to the board. You want a, a really nice amount of flour or cornmeal underneath just to keep things really moving. Uh, more is better in this case. And then when we get into the vinaigrette, a mixing bowl and a whisk. Um, so just, you know, I think we'll actually probably pause in case anyone needs to grab any of those extra ingredients that you might not have thought of. Um, maybe I'll show you really quickly. You can, we'll just do sort of one big pause. So I'm gonna, so I'm a big advocate, advocate of giving, getting everything you need. Uh, you know, ready to go right at your fingertips. So you're not sort of stopping, starting, stopping, starting. So maybe uh, as you're gathering those ingredients, we can talk about the herbs that we're gonna use. Certainly could put these in your caramelized onions. You could put these right on your flatbread, um, though I wouldn't recommend putting them right on the top because they'll burn in the oven, but you could bury them in there with all the ingredients. Um, and then certainly in the vinaigrette, I'm gonna use these today in the vinaigrette. So I'm actually gonna wash these first. So as you're gathering your ingredients, you might wanna get herbs if you're using those. And just run them under the sink. And then you can actually, you can actually bundle the herbs up. I'm sort of folding them on themselves and just kind of give them a big shake to get that water off. So we can get our herbs lined up to use and we'll chop those uh, right after we do the onion. Um, what else can we do? I think this is probably a good chance just to take a minute. Talents, let me know when you're ready to keep going, but just to let everybody gather ingredients, wrangle their kids, uh, do whatever you need to do. Um, 
and then we'll get going with uh, caramelizing or chopping onions and caramelizing onions. Well, cool. this is a, a good pause, good time to take a minute. Nice. I was telling talents earlier, I'm trying really hard to get things out of my cabinets without messing up my camera angle. <laughs> well, bear with me if I just go sideways for a second. So everyone, while everyone is gathering your ingredients, uh, Tony has two cameras uh, positioned. He has the camera that we're seeing him talk on and he has a cutting board camera. If you hover over that cutting board camera, you'll see three dots. You can uh, pin that video so you can see the cutting board camera in a bigger screen while he's talking to you and not lose that video. Uh, it'll make this experience a little more enjoyable and you can see what he's talking about instead of having to look at the little thumbnail. All right, is everybody ready to go? Looks like everybody's in a good position. Yes. And you know, time permitting, I'm glad to um, answer any questions unrelated to what we're doing tonight. Or if you want to think about ways that we say, ways that you might want to next level what we're doing. Uh, I'm glad to answer questions and just kind of round out the hour with anything you guys want to know or brainstorm on. It's fun. I love talking about food, obviously. All right, so it's so funny because I keep thinking I need to focus on this, but we're going to focus on here. So um, I'll start here. So um, so this is an onion. Okay. Um, so there's the root end of the onion and the stem end. And I'm not presuming to know anything more about onions than everyone in this room. But um, uh, I, I get nervous when I see people hacking away at onions in funny ways. And so I'm going to show you kind of a basic idea, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, to break down the onion. Uh, and then we'll talk about different things you can do once it's broken down like that. So just remember the root end and then the stem end at the top. So what I'm going to do is no matter what, I'm going to take the stem end off. So, let's get, so I'm just going to slice right through. I'm going to take that stem end off. And then for today, I'm going to, I'm turning it over. So you never, you never want to kind of like, you always want to sort of get yourself to a flat surface as quickly as possible. Um, you don't want to be trying to do something with a knife and a vegetable when it's rocking and rolling around. So I got to a flat surface, so I'm taking it straight down here just to minimize, um, the, you know, the risk of injury, obviously. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut right through the root end. And the root end obviously is keeping all of these um, the layers of the onion intact. So uh, now I'm going to peel off. We've all done this. We probably did this last night at dinner. But I'm going to peel off. Okay. So, I'm do both so I can show you two different, two different techniques. So, so I would say traditionally for caramelizing onions, you would use those long strips, like the julienne strips. Um, you know, kind of like a fajita cut. Um, and so for that, what I'm going to do is actually cut the root end off. So now I have this piece. I just want to check my angle. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so you basically, so yeah, easier said than done. It definitely takes some practice, but you want to kind of keep your fingers curled under. Talents, is that a good angle for everyone? Talents? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so you want to keep your fingers curled under because if you're doing that, you know, if you're sort of willy nilly with your fingers out like this, God knows what's going to happen. But if you're like this, it's just more controlled. You, you're very safe. This knife is fairly sharp, but you're pretty safe just sort of butting right up to your knuckles. And what I'm going to do is actually just sort of go, and I'm actually going to kind of go, you know, at kind of like the um, six across, across a clock, right? I'm just going to sort of make my way through, uh, kind of angling, getting more straight up as I get to the top. And I'm getting these sections, right? These aren't tethered anymore by the roots. So I'm getting these sections that just break up. And so this is like a julienne. We can, um, uh, we can saute these, we can caramelize these. Uh, you can just make some fajitas real quick. Uh, so I'm actually gonna put these going. I might put the heat up a little higher than I normally would on the stove. Again, if I were caramelizing, I would be very, very low and slow for about an hour. Uh, for today, 
uh, so that they actually have a little bit of color on them when it's time for me to get the flatbread going. Uh, my stove is just out of shot. I mean, uh, and I'll keep bringing the, this pan into shot to show you um, how far we've come. So I have a little bit of oil, and I actually just, this may be a little dangerous, but I just like scoop these up with the knife. I'm not anywhere near the blade. Um, and I'm gonna transfer these into the pan. A little bit of salt and pepper, certainly any flavors that you like, fresh herbs, dry herbs, spice. For today, I'm just gonna do salt and pepper. Okay, and then this is what I really wanna show you, because this can be kind of overwhelming is the idea of chopping an onion smaller, dicing an onion. Um, so let me go this way first. So the, here's the big idea. So you can see all the cross sections. It's totally kept, layers are kept intact by the root end. So we are going to chop, chop, chop this way. So we kind of have these planks running through. I'm going to go most of the way through, but not all the, all the way to the end of the roof. So I'm going to chop, chop, chop. And then I'm going to come this way and I'm going to chop, chop, chop over the, over the top. So let me show you that right now. I'm going to hold my hand nice and flat. Kind of running out of runway here. So nice and flat, don't have my fingers sort of in the way of the blade. I'm just going to come through my fingers. My knuckles are kind of knocking on the edge of my countertop out here. But I'm going to make my way through. If you go too far, obviously those layers are going to kind of explode. So you don't really, uh, you know, better to be a little more modest and not go all the way through. And then, like I said, I'm going to chop, chop, chop this way. So these aren't going to be necessarily kind of like the, the hands of a clock. I'm just going to go straight. Straight down, straight sort of knocking right straight down into the bottom. Again, trying to keep the root end intact. So I'm coming across. And if you're nervous, and, you know, you're, you're sort of not sure how to navigate this last little bit, leave it, leave it. don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm going to go all the way to the end. Um, so now just to reset, I chop, chop, chop. I chop, chop, chop. And then now, this is when he's moving. So now it's going to be really easy as I just sort of slice kind of right through the onion. And I'm just rocking kind of in one big motion. I'm getting a small dice of this onion. And this can be the base for a million things. Certainly if you're maybe searing chicken and you're making a pan sauce, uh, this is a great size uh, that you would want to use for that. Um, lots of different reasons why we need a small dice of onion like that. Um, you know, technically there are small, medium, and large dice, and there are very precise uh, measurements for those. I uh, do what feels right for you and what you like eating. Um, but you would just sort of be, you know, wider with those cuts uh, in the different directions as you go. So this is, um, this is chopping the onion. So hopefully that makes sense. Glad, uh, glad to open it up for questions. If anybody, if anybody, uh, you know, flags a question uh, for talents as we're going. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to just keep going into mincing garlic and then in. 20 minutes if you have a question about onions, we'll just answer that. All right, so I'm gonna transfer these, I'll use these in some way later. I'm just gonna transfer these off to the side. All right. And this is just a quick reminder, you can ask questions in the chat um, or you can raise your hand um, using the, the um, oh, looks like we got our first question and I see a hand up too. I'm gonna to start first with the question in the chat um, Alicia is asking, do we, what's the preheat oven temperature? Oh, great question. Thank you so much for, for asking. Um, I'm a glutton for punishment. I have mine at 475 right now. Uh, I really want to get some nice color. Uh, though I will say we had our air conditioning prepared today. So, uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm taking full advantage. I'm cranking the oven and I'm turning the air conditioning on. Uh, yeah. So 475. So I actually, that's, that's kind of reminds me of something else. Um, I always keep a pizza stone in my oven. Um, I'll be putting the, the, the flatbread right on it. Um, I, ovens vary so much. I mean, this, this is another, there's not kind of one size, one size uh, fits all. Um, so pizza stones, you know, mine's just a, a thick slab of stone that is really just helping to regulate the heat. Um, sometimes I have to take it out if I'm baking because if I'm setting something right on it or even fairly close to it, um, it's radiating more heat. And so you actually would sort of cook the bottom of something you were baking a little faster. Uh, so that's, Really, to be honest, to me, that's the only time it's a liability. I keep the pizza stone in the oven all the time. Um, and so, yeah, a uh, great question because I actually um, have had mine preheated for about an hour. So mine's ready to go. Um, and one thing I'm gonna show you for people who are a little nervous about transferring the, the flatbread in, um, you certainly, um, I'm gonna show you. In my house, we love cooking on cast iron. And this is actually a basically a cast iron frying pan that has very, very shallow walls. Uh, we cook 
everything. We, we cook everything in my house on this thing. Um, I happen to just love it. Um, if you're really nervous about transferring, you could actually build your pizza on a, on a cookie sheet or on a pan like this, uh, anything that's oven safe, and you could just transfer it right into a really hot oven. So you're not gonna get maybe that sort of sear that's gonna start happening right away if you're dropping the, the pizza you know, right onto something hot, transferring it onto something hot. It's gonna take a while for the oven to bring this up to temperature as well. But if you're feeling a little unsure and you don't wanna clean up toppings off the bottom of your oven, because you know that's what's gonna happen if you try, um, then uh, just, just transfer in from cold with something like this. Uh, Tony, I do see another question that popped up in the chat. And it says, this is from TJ. He hey. says, if I, if, I, if I was making a mirepoix, I don't even know if I'm- Mirepoix, yeah. Mirepoix, do I need to dice veggies that small? Depends on what you're doing. So if I'm, uh, so mirepoix, carrots, onion, and celery, which is the base of almost every, uh, you know, soup and, um, you know, like rooted in French technique. Um, depends on what you're doing. If I'm braising, I'm pretty sort of, uh, kind of big and sloppy about the pieces that I'm using because I'm nestling those right in the meats that I'm braising and then I'm just pulling them out or actually usually I would probably pull them out and then blend them up and that would give body to the to the sauce that's going to go with the braised meat. Um, yeah you definitely don't need to. I mean the more the more surface area the more chance for caramelization. So if you have like one big section of carrot you're not going to have as much caramelization on the surface as you would with that same amount of carrot that was diced up small. Uh, so it just kind of depends on, on what you're doing. Um, I think it's sort of silly when people spend a lot of time uh, precisely chopping vegetables that are just going to get blended or kind of like discarded. So just uh, depends, depends on what you're doing, I guess I would say. All right, so garlic. So here's the deal. We're going to do a totally different, uh, take a different approach with how we're using a knife for the garlic. So the way I like to do it is the tip of my knife is never, ever going to lead uh, the board. I'm just going to constantly rock through this garlic. You might sort of start, I'm just going to do two cloves of garlic like this, and then you might just sort of start like that. And then now, as I really start to mince it up, um, my the tip is just going to stay on the board no matter what. I hope you guys are staying with this. Um, and then what I, the other thing I like to do, so now you know, of course, every time you go through, you're going to get garlic all over the ends. So what I like to do is take my fingers on either side of the knife and just pinch across the knife and just slide it down. Putting the knife, you're going to need to do that all the time. If you don't, you're going to have these giant pieces of garlic that stick to the knife um, and everything on the board is minced and then you're still going to have these big pieces on your knife. So uh, I'm just sort of, you know, I know that I'm not running the risk of cutting myself. It's basically impossible in this position. It's impossible to cut myself. And after I've run through a few times, again, I'm just going to clean it off, mound it up again, and keep going. Um, one trick, I don't do this that often, but one trick is that after you get it pretty well minced, some people will actually sprinkle a, a really heavy amount of salt um, over the garlic. And that salt is an abrasive. Actually, salt is the, uh, you're not, it sounds kind of wild, but on this cast iron that I love using, you're not supposed to use soap because it actually takes off the seasoning that you work to build up on the cast iron. So we actually don't, I actually scrub that with salt because it's an abrasive in the stove uh, to get it clean. And then I just, um, Put it on a really hot stove top, and I um, and that sort of burns everything off. And then you rub it with a little a little sheen of oil after. Um, so if you actually at this point, if you if you sprinkle a little salt right on this, it'll actually just sort of help you further break it down. And some people will actually use the knife, a little more dangerous, I guess, and actually just like press through it because the salt is just going to kind of keep helping you uh, break through this guy. And you need to season the food anyway. Um, and I don't cook with salted butter, so. Um, you know, there's an opportunity to get some more salt in this dish. So that's definitely one way if you want to get this almost to more of a paste consistency. You wouldn't really get it to a paste if it's in the raw form like this, um, but it helps you sort of get it super minced like this. So that's something to think about. And then, Tony, we just had another question pop up in the chat. There you go. I just basically, as I was chatting with you guys, I got, I got it down right where you did. Yep. We got one from Jennifer. She says, are there any secrets for peeling garlic? She says it's her first, least favorite job. Yeah, garlic's interesting. Um, it's super annoying and it will stay on your fingers for a real long time. Uh, they say if you rub stainless steel on your fingers, um, it'll, it'll help get it off. Um, so if you're okay with the, the clove of garlic not being intact, you can, uh, let me grab some more garlic here. Let's just pretend that this clove of garlic is, um, is uh, with the paper on it. 
Um, if you're okay with it not being attacked because you're gonna maybe take it down like this, you can actually just sort of go over the top. People go crazy and do this big dramatic whack. I don't like that. I actually just like to press on it until you hear it kind of give. And then you see this broke. Well, it actually stayed technically intact, but it's kind of wanting to go into three pieces. Um, and, and then you can get the paper off really easily around it. So technically, if for some reason you really do need to keep it intact, and sometimes that's the case, you actually would want to get it from the root end. So see, here's kind of the butt end of the garlic. Um, you can sh you can just chop that off, and then it's a lot easier to get the paper off of it uh, than it is going from the top. That would be my recommendation. And then certainly you can use a microplane. This is a really common uh, tool in the kitchen. I don't know if you guys have any of these. Uh, really will help you just sort of paste up garlic as you go. So this, keep your fingers out of the way, but this basically, the garlic's just disappearing onto the backside of the microplane. Um, my absolute favorite thing to do with a microplane is to grate Parmesan. When you grate a, a block of Parmesan cheese on the microplane, it's the most like feathery, sort of pretty little mound of, of cheese. And it, it literally just uh, melts and disappears into, the, into a hot dish that you're finishing Parmesan on it. I love it. I think that's really cool. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, we are gonna get into the herbs. Again, we're just gonna get the herbs uh, chopped now to use in the vinaigrette later. So hopefully you guys had a chance to, um, to wash them. Uh, so I'm using parsley today. And there are a lot of these like thicker stem ends, of course. So I'm gonna sort of not be too precious about it, but I'm gonna basically get as many of these uh, thicker stem ends out of the way as I can. Obviously, this is so. If you're if you're pureeing, uh, Tony Caters has the most incredible chimichurri recipe uh, that we top on grilled salmon and all sorts of different dishes. Um, it's, and so that's a puree with like cilantro and parsley and garlic and a little little spice uh, vinegar. Um, in that case, um, there's actually a ton of flavor and moisture in these stems, so please don't throw them away. Please use them um, in, a, in a in a puree if that's what you're doing. But um, these are just going to kind of be in the way if people are actually. These uh, right on a salad dressing. So I'm going to get these out of the way. And then they'll actually just sort of, as you start breaking, breaking this down and getting into it, they'll just kind of keep revealing themselves. <laughs> and you can just kind of keep getting them out of the way. So I'll get that going. Okay. So what I like to do is basically bundle these up as tight as I can. Just kind of really, the same way I rinse them, just sort of bundle it on itself. I'm going to, my intention is to keep the tip of the knife on the board. But I'm just going to sort of, instead of rocking back and forth, I'm going to make big slices. I'm just going to sort of slice. Count, is that looking like a good angle? Yeah, that looks fine, Tony. Nice. Okay, and then basically I'm just going to keep putting it together. You might turn it just to get it another direction. But I'm just sort of slicing right through, and you'll notice. And the sharper the knife and the more decisive the cut, I would say, the less chance that you're going to bruise those herbs. Uh, if I have a dull knife and I'm kind of doing this, uh, and, you know, they're going to they're gonna get kind of bruised and uh, just kind of beat up. So um, now they're going to, again, if I have my fingers on the top, like I do now, uh, I run no risk of, uh, I run no risk of cutting myself. It's literally impossible to cut myself. I mean, I guess nothing impossible, right? But um, <laughs> I would be quite impressed if you figure out a way to cut yourself using this technique with your knife. I want to thank everybody for keeping the questions going. We really appreciate it. Uh, we got another one um, for Tony. This question says, do you let your garlic sit out a bit to develop allicin before you cook it? Interesting. I do let it sit out a bit, and I don't know why I do it. So I'm going to say yes, it's to develop allicin. I, I don't know. Um, I don't like, um, I think it in a weird way kind of goes bad faster if it's in the refrigerator. It just sort of gets kind of wet and kind of swampy and just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So um, I do leave it out. Um, really all rest restaurants and catering companies are not using garlic in the peel uh, like at home. I, I mean, that's certainly at home, that's how I use it as well. Um, but, at, but at work, we're getting it um, in the big bags that are pre-peeled. Um, so at home, I have it in the, in, uh, you know, like with anything, right? It's, the more you can leave the root end intact, like, like it would be silly to, if you, I'm sure if you broke it up off of the root end and it was just a big sort of bowl of um, individual cloves in the paper, I'm sure it would go bad faster um, uh, than, uh, than if you had it sitting intact like that. So I sit, I leave it intact and I just break pieces off as I need it. Um, one thing that we do at work, we use a lot of roasted garlic at work. So we actually, well, it's really more like a garlic confit, which means it's sort of cooked submerged in fat. Submerged in fat. 
So we actually cook those garlic cloves without the paper in a really heavy amount of um, oil, uh, covered in the oven, you know, till they're soft through maybe like um, 30 minutes at like 300, 325. Uh, and then we blend that up and we use that garlic paste in a lot of things, but then you have this great oil, which certainly you could keep up to a week in your refrigerator and use this great infused oil, which is a unexpected segue into infusing oil, which is the next thing I want to talk about by coincidence. So um, this is kind of, you know, this isn't rocket science, but this is just thinking about ways you can next level your flavors and the experience. I love using infused oils. I was just talking coincidentally about the, the garlic oil at work, um, but you can infuse any flavors that you like into oil. And so, and you could brush that over the top of this flatbread. You could use it in a salad dressing. So you could have like a roasted garlic salad dressing. Uh, I mean, you could brush salmon before you bake it, anything, anything, right? It's just sort of a basic technique you can take in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of people really subscribe to this idea that you need to um, start it in cold oil because if you, you, would, you don't want to burn anything that you're infusing in the oil because it'll give some bitterness. I don't think it, it bitters anything enough to matter that much. So what I actually did right before we started was I started some oil in the world's smallest little pan. Uh, and then I got it really ripping hot. And then I can bring it over here. I got it ripping hot. I turned the stove off and then I dropped in some garlic and some rosemary. Uh, we grow rosemary outside. Can you see that? Nice. And I basically just set it off to the side. The garlic started sizzling. It definitely got some color on it. Um, but then, you know, it, it, I mean, if anything, the garlic and the rosemary were going to start cooling down the oil, right? So uh, you don't, really don't run the risk of burning it. So now I have this great rosemary garlic oil uh, that I can use on my pizza. Uh, if talents will remind me to use it once we get there. Uh, and uh, anyway, so really cool. Um, so that's a, that's a cool trick, I think. Tony, it looks like we have a, a hand raised. Hey. I see Lola over there. I'm going to unmute Lola hey, Lola. here. Do you need garlic, onion, and parsley to make your pizza? Am I using it? I will use that tonight. Oh. Does that sound delicious or horrible? I've never tried vegetarian pizza. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, you like garlic? Not sure? I used it for a delicious salmon and made it better. Nice, nice. So I'm, a, I'm in the camp that says garlic makes it better no matter what. Um, yeah, <laughs> Deanna is too. I love garlic. So if you like garlic, you're going to love it on your pizza, uh, for sure. Um, and yeah, definitely oil. And, uh, and yeah, the, the only thing is you wouldn't want to put the fresh um, you wouldn't want to put the fresh uh, parsley right on top of the pizza because this oven is really hot and it would really burn that. So I'm going to show you a trick to make sure you don't burn any of the ingredients that go on top of the flatbread. Good question, thank you. Okay, so I think of my little list of what I want to talk to you guys about, infusing oil I felt really strongly, strongly about. Um, we'll take a minute to get set up. I'm going to swap out my board, get ready to roll this flatbread. I'm sure you guys are going to need a minute too. So Talents, you tell me when you're ready to start. No problem. Uh, once again, I do want to thank everybody for uh, some very good um, and well thought out questions. Um, once again, keep those coming um, and we'll get to them as quickly as we possibly can. And, and I'll pause Tony or, or what have you so we can get the, him to answer those questions. So thank you so much. Sure. We also want to thank you, our members, for sticking with us through this interesting time. Um, yeah. Once again, we're, we're going to continue to have uh, uh, online sessions like this. So uh, once again, keep those questions and, uh, and thank you for your membership. And thank you to the UPS guy that just brought a package to my door. I can see through the window. Thank you. That's, that's not new ingredients, is it? Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> Guys, hold on. I have some herbs. That, hold on, hold on. Um, all right, so I'm ready whenever you are, Talents. Okay, we're ready. Cool. All right, so. This is the official Tony Cater's flatbread. Um, all right. So like I said, a um, couple of things. Um, bench flour, they call this bench flour. Um, the more the merrier. The last thing you want to be, do is, want to be doing is fighting with this, uh, fighting with the dough as it's sticking to the board. 
So uh, feel free to be really generous. Um, that's one thing. Uh, probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, I apologize, but if you grabbed all your ingredients, theoretically, you got that dough out of the refrigerator. The dough is just gonna be a lot more forgiving if it is um, up to room temperature. Um, the, um, I'm certainly not a food scientist, but I think you guys all know that, you know, there's gluten and flour. And the more you kind of work, you know, if you sort of mix those cookies for an hour before you baked them, they would taste really different than they would if you were sort of light and delicate with them because you develop the gluten uh, structure in the, in the flour um, and it gets really tough. So um, a couple of things, the, the dough can just sort of calm down if it's been sitting out at room temperature. But the other thing, if you really feel like the dough you're using is really fighting back as you're rolling it, it's sort of rolling right back on you and telling you to you know, back off. Um, one of the tricks is to just go do something else for a few minutes and let it just sort of calm back down. And you'll actually find if you leave it for 10 or 15 minutes, it will totally uh, give and you can, you can uh, roll it out even further. So I'm gonna take a bunch of this flour and I'm actually gonna press it this way and I'm gonna press it this way just to make sure I have a lot on. I have a really cool marble rolling pin um, that I think is cool but not practical because it's so heavy. Um, it really just sort of weighs down the food. Um, I also have another rolling pin that has the, the tapered edges, the right, that go down. Um, I feel like that sort of makes a deep well in the thing you're rolling and then it's not as deep on the sides. So I love this um, very lightweight, consistently round uh, rolling pin. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm really, I'm not gonna be rolling towards myself. I'm gonna be rolling away always. Um, you can also put the flour right on here. So I'm just gonna be rolling away and away. And it, it doesn't matter if this is uneven. Um, you know, we're gonna get, the, sorry, you know, it's, it's uh, cool when it's rustic anyway, um, but, but we'll sort of even it out as we go. So I'm, I'm focusing on the half of the dough that's away from me. I'm not really focused on this part that's, I don't know if you can see it, but this part that's mounted up uh, closer to me. And then basically I'm just gonna turn it over and then I'm gonna sort of always focus on going away. I'm just gonna sort of keep, you know, and where I see it and see this dough's kind of pushing back on me. I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna be in charge of this dough. I'm gonna kind of spread it out. Um, wherever it feels like it's sort of thicker, um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep focusing on that area. And then if you're feeling really adventurous and you wanna just sort of, you know, go big and make a name for yourself, feel free to toss this up in the air, let it stick to your ceiling. Um, I'm not gonna be doing that tonight, but a couple of tricks. So, I mean, this is practically as flat as I might want it. Um, I certainly can make it a lot thinner if I want, but, but to me, this is about a quarter inch thick. This is feeling like cer certainly enough. A couple of tricks, if you wanna just sort of stretch it out, you can do a couple of things. You can literally just sort of hold it up like this um, and just sort of a delicate finger, sort of let gravity take its course and spread this out. Another thing you can do, probably a little bit more effective, is you can actually sort of drape this over your fingers the last thing, I'll get closer to the camera here. The last thing you want to do is poke your fingers up and next thing you know, you're going to see your fingers through the dough. So let's not do that. I'm going to keep my fingers sort of down like this, kind of in a claw. And that's actually going to be a chance. And I'm just going to sort of work this around. I'm putting flour all over my floor, but that's okay. I'm going to work this around. And again, gravity is going to, and I'm sort of pulling it sort of slightly as I'm, as I'm going, but I'm kind of working it out. This is giving a little, I do not run the risk, famous last words, of poking through the sweat bread. And I'm just sort of getting it as big as I think I need it. Okay. If I want to check, I can put it down here. I don't know if you can see the whole dough in here. So this is about a, know, maybe about an eight inch uh, kind of personal pizza. Um, and that's really about as flat as I think I need it. Again, I can't stress enough. It, if, it, if, the, if the dough is pulling back on you because that gluten is too developed, uh, you, you won't win. Uh, there's no need to give extra muscle to it. Um, it, it it's one at that point. So um, your best bet at that point would just be to kind of hang back a minute, let it relax and kind of come back down. Um, uh, yeah, you just, <laughs> you won't have the opportunity. But again, uh, let it come up to room temperature. Um, you know, be really decisive with your rolls for sure. And you should be very successful. Okay, now here's one thing I wanna show you. We're basically gonna get right into the toppings. So I feel really strongly that you could use flour technically, but cornmeal. So I have just some really basic cornmeal here. I'm actually going to sprinkle cornmeal right on my pan because I'm going to transfer this. Um, I'm going to transfer this to my stone uh, from, from this board. So I've sprinkled a pretty generous amount of cornmeal. 
um, on my on my sort of transfer pan here. I'm going to lay this down the way I want it. And at this point, the cornmeal is sort of just acting as rollers. Maybe I shouldn't do this here. It's just sort of acting as a roller and letting me do whatever I want. So when the time comes with the toppings, I can literally kind of get an angle. I'm not about a 45 degree angle. And I can just, you know, with decide in, in a very decisive way, I can just sort of send this on its way uh, into the oven if I'm transferring to a cookie sheet or a stone that's in the oven. Um, but again, just um, we're here to have fun. So if you want to just build it right on your sheet pan, build it on your sheet pan and then put that cold sheet pan in the oven, it's still going to be a really good pizza. Okay, so. Just to Tony, while you were working your magic, we got about three questions all hey. back to back. So you, you're doing something right. Nice. Um, Let me tell you what, what, what I'm going to do and then, I'll, and then we can answer the questions while I actually Gotcha. It. I'm going to start, I mean, you guys have all seen this. I'm not uh, inventing anything new here. I'm going to start with sauce. So in my case, I'm just using a tomato basil sauce. Hopefully you guys can see that well. So always sauce on the bottom. But what I really want to stress is even if there's a lot of cheese in sort of in the pizza as you're building it, I always like to finish it with more cheese on the top or maybe the only cheese I'm using on the top because um, that's basically going to be the glue that kind of helps. It, it, it'll ensure that nothing burns uh, because it's just that cheese that's cooking on the top. And it's going to be the, be the glue that kind of keeps everything down. Sometimes what we'll actually do at work, we do flatbreads at work for appetizers. Uh, we'll take all of the different ingredients and we'll actually just toss them into this big mix of all of the things and then put it there. Because if you have sort of cheese and then artichokes and then tomatoes and then whatever, uh, you're asking for trouble, right? So uh, I like to mix it all up. So I'm basically going to top this with, some, with, hi Lola. I'm going to top this with some, some things that sound good to me. I'm going to put mozzarella over the top and then I'm going to send it into the oven. All right, what's the question? All right, so the first question we got was when you wash your wooden rolling pin, yep. do you dry it right away? Um, the concern is that with soapy water, it might soak into the wood. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I always um, am really aggressive with soap on it. Uh, I, you know, um, I'm kind of a stickler about like, um, I, I will use soap, but I'm really aggressive to make sure that I'm not leaving a lot of residual soap on it. Um, and then I put it right on the drain board and, and let it drain that way. And, if, and you, don't, you don't want it to be touching something else because that part that's touching will just sort of stay wet. The next question we got was any recommendation on uh, places to buy dough besides Tony Caters? Oh yeah, Tony Caters. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a little bit of this garlic and rosemary oil and I'm going to brush the edges because that sounds good to me. And that'll help it sort of shine as I cook it. But I'm also, I just like it. So I'm just going to sort of drizzle it over the top. Um, I think the Trader, the Trader Joe's dough is good. Um, you know, we, we've actually, uh, we've actually bought just dough at Willow Street Pizza before. Um, so I know that's an option. I don't know if that's sort of is something they really want to do or they just feel like compelled to do it. But especially these days, uh, I'm sure they're very willing. So you can actually buy balls of dough there. Um, I've, I've seen people do that at two of the locations. So I think it's a standard thing. Um, our dough recipe uh, serves the extended family of everybody on this call. So that's why we didn't share it. But I can definitely find a recipe that I like and send it out a little later. All right, so I'm putting, uh, I have a swap out that I'm going to show you that my son's going to have later. Uh, he will not, he will want nothing to do with the blue cheese and artichoke hearts, but that's what I'm doing for this one. Uh, so these are pretty big pieces of artichoke hearts. I'm just sort of setting those on the top. Um, sliced cherry peppers. I'm going to seal the deal and make sure he doesn't want any of this one. So some cherry peppers. I put a little blue cheese on the bottom. I'm going to put some of that sort of brine that the cherry peppers are in even. <clears throat> So I have the onions that are officially um, sauteed. They, these are not caramelized. I cooked these a little hotter just so they'd be ready for me. So I'm gonna um, pop it with some of these. All right. And again, you're not gonna be able to see me putting this in the oven, but I just can't stress enough that basically those little, um, that cornmeal that I put on, on there is basically ball bearings that are making sure that I'm not gonna have a drama when I'm at the oven, particularly because when I open the oven door and it's 475 degrees coming at me, you know, everything's gonna sort of get soft and start melding into each other. So it's gonna be that much harder to get it off, right? So better that I have those little rollers and I can just sort of slide this right off. So I'm gonna to top this with a fairly generous amount of cheese. It's really not the time for austerity. We're, we're having pizza. Um, I'm gonna wash my hands. <clears throat> And you're not going to be able to see me do it, but again, you've seen it. Uh, the idea is 
you know, I'm in charge. The pizza's not in charge. Uh, this is sliding right around for me just like I want it. And that's that. So if you guys have been following along, we can take a second. Um, we're getting pretty close on time, but we can put these in the oven uh, now, or you can even just take a minute to finish up and get yours in the oven. I'm going to put mine in. And then while all of that's happening, we're going to go kind of quickly through a vinaigrette. So this is a, a great example of just sort of a good standard technique that you can keep in your back pocket. Um, maybe so I, uh, so I don't run out of time in remembering the alternative that I wanted to show you. Um, what I'm, I think I'll put it here. Is that gonna be a good angle? Talents, is that a good angle for what I just said on the board? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's good, Tony. Yeah, so I basically, um, before, we, before we all got on the call, I have another cast iron grill pan. Uh, certainly doesn't have to be cast iron. Um, I got it rip roaring hot on the stove top. I rolled one of these flatbreads out and I just seared the heck out of it on both sides. Um, and I made these little sort of like, I don't know, these little crostini kind of pizza spear things, um, which are super cool. You could put these on a board with salami and vegetables and things like that. And you could even just sort of roll them up into these little pita bites. Um, you could pair these with hummus and it could be kind of like a chips and dip concept. Um, you could somehow, you could use these as croutons on your salad. That would be really fun. Uh, so uh, you could think of a bunch of different ways that you to use the vinaigrette. Um, you could grill chicken uh, in cubes, whether on skewers or not. You could, uh, once it's done grilling, you could pour that vinaigrette over the top. It, you know, it's gonna absorb the flavors when it's warm still. You could put that vinaigrette and you could sort of serve that with these and kind of roll them up as little kind of like pita bites. So, you know, this is not a pizza night, it's a flatbread night. And so there are just a lot of cool ways that you could do flatbread. So bear that in mind. Um, sometimes uh, for a quick weeknight dinner, we'll actually just sort of make like a garlic bread kind of style naan. So we'll take like store-bought naan and we'll put Parmesan and garlic and just um, toast it up in kind of a similar way and serve these on the side for dinner. So, so that's pretty fun. Tony, that's actually a good segue into my next question I got privately. What's the big difference between um, flatbread and pizza? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. There's this, we use this term a lot on our menus, galette. Which, I, which uh, is basically just, uh, I don't remember what the French translation is, but uh, you know, basically just sort of like a disc, right? Like a little pie or a disc. And so we'll make apple galette and onion galette and all these different things. Um, uh, I think technically flatbreads are not leavened with yeast, um, technically. And so I guess, so this one is, so I guess, okay, we're taking some liberties with the term flatbread. Um, I, this, this is sort of dorky. I can't remember all the details because she got so in the weeds, but there's a really good, um, uh, bon Appetit podcast on Luminary, which is one of the podcast platforms. And I was listening to someone who was talking, like, you know, a month or two ago when yeast was like impossible to find, and they were coming up with all of these different ways that you can uh, leaven uh, bread. So, it, so it wasn't, nothing was risen with yeast. All right, so here's the deal. Um, we shared some instructions for uh, quantities. Um, I have them here with me. Quantities for, uh, for vinaigrette, but here's really what I want to stress. A really small amount of Dijon mustard is the first thing that should go um, in your vinaigrette uh, because that gives good flavor. I love mustard, but it also helps emulsify the dressing. So we have a couple of tricks so that the dressing is not totally separated. Um, a couple of them that we'll talk about, but one of them for sure is the mustard. It will actually help emulsify. So put, you know, a small amount, all you need is a small amount of, this is a really nice whole grain, what does this say? a whole grain, uh, Dijon mustard. So I'm going to stick that in the bowl. A small amount, that's kind of a generous amount because I just like it so much. But all, a small amount is all you need. Here's the big idea. You need one part of acid, and in our case it's going to be a mix of lemon juice and rice vinegar tonight. Uh, one part of acid to three parts of oil. That's all you need to know. Um, and that is, <laughs> that's a, a ballpark kind of idea. Whatever sounds good to you. Um, I, I don't love sort of an over oily vinaigrette, so I might sort of scale back on that. Um, think about what you like, think about how all the ingredients that you're going to put the vinaigrette on are going to uh, balance out those flavors and maybe bring down some of the acidity or the, or the oiliness of it. So whatever sounds good to you, but the rule, the technical rule is three parts of oil to one part of acid. Okay, so I'm going to start, we'll, we'll season it at the end if we need to modify, but I'm going to start with the seasoning that I think is right. Um, I can be pretty aggressive on salt, so I'm going to try to scale back just a little bit. 
Um, I am glad to be very aggressive on pepper, so I'm going to go pretty heavy on pepper. And at this point, so you certainly could just mix in the herbs at the end again. I'm going to use that parsley that, um, that we chopped earlier. Um, I actually like putting it in now because I think it's actually, I'm going to sort of beat the parsley up. And, and infuse more of the flavor than if I just sort of stir it in politely right at the end. So I'm going to put it in now. Um, you certainly could put raw garlic. Um, I think I'm just going to do that actually. Um, that's kind of a big thing. Lola, Lola would like that. I don't know if the rest of you guys would like that. Um, so here's the deal. You can, you can dump all of your acid in now. So feel free to do that. And then we're going to strain the oil in later. So I'll actually show you quickly. Um, so I actually did wash this earlier, but you would want to wash this, particularly if you're going to be using the, the zest of it, um, which I think I will. So I'm going to take that same uh, microplane. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I'm going to zest in just a little bit, really just for a really sort of bright, fresh clay. I'm going to put some of the zest in. But then what I'm going to do, ooh, and I can really smell that right now. So then what I'm going to do is actually roll this. You guys have probably done this and sort of, you know, put a lot of force on it. You can roll this to really break up those cells in there and get the, get the juices flowing. Um, and then as I cut into this, and then, you know, I, I don't like the trick. For, this is personal preference. I think it's sort of silly to do this and let the seed catch, magically catch the seeds in your finger. I never magically catch the seeds in my finger ever. So um, usually what I'll do is I'll just sort of see how many, how many seeds I can see. I'll just knock those out. There are other ones waiting, lying in wait there, but I'll just knock those out as an insurance policy to make sure I'm not going to get seeds. And then I might hold it up with a cut side up, but I'm going to put, and then as I say this, I'll probably get 100 seeds in there. Um, I'm going to get, again, we're going one part acid, um, three parts oil. You could kind of go 50-50. In this case, I'm using uh, the rice wine vinegar uh, and the lemon. So I'm I'm eyeballing it because I know it's just not that serious. It's just not that serious. But if you want, uh, grab those teaspoon measures and go for it. Okay, so this is everything that I want sort of, you know, more or less kind of, I almost said muscle minnows, more, more or less uh, gathered together. Actually, I probably need a little more acid. Okay. And then I'm going to, I am going to eyeball this, um, that, uh, that that's the right amount. And then I'm going to start with the oil. So I transferred my extra virgin olive oil. I mean, this is, we're not cooking this down. This is not the time to use your cheaper oil. This is obviously when you want the oil to be kind of forward with flavor and quality. So uh, this is extra virgin olive oil. I put it in my little pancake syrup pitcher that we use on the weekends. Uh, <laughs> I put it in this little pitcher uh, because the point is a couple of things actually. You want to stream it in very slowly so that um, the, acid and the oil have a chance to emulsify and really hold together. It's not going to hold together till the end of time, um, but it's, it's going to hold together in a really kind of like harmonious way um, uh, uh, so that you have a more emulsified dressing. Um, okay, so this part is done. I'm ready for the oil. There is a trick that I probably should have mentioned sooner. Uh, really, really awesome trick. So take a, take a kitchen towel, sort of twist it on itself and get it wet. So I got this wet. I'm gonna wring out the water. So I have this sort of um, sort of snake, this wet kitchen towel snake here. Um, I'm gonna put this in a ring on my countertop to hold the bowl in place. I hope you guys can see that really well. So basically, within reason, as I really start whisking this as I'm adding oil, um, I don't run the risk of this bowl getting away from me. So uh, really great trick. Uh, if you're whipping cream, we do a lot of whipped cream at home. Uh, from scratch, um, that's also a good trick for this. Um, but any, anything when you need to sort of have some control and stream it in. And so what I have in here is about three parts. I don't think I'll use quite all of it. And hopefully you can see this as I stream in. So I'm just really slowly, and since I have this in a pour spot already, I have the opportunity to be really controlled about it. And what I want to do is I want to see the oil basically emulsifying right in as I go. And if I see it start to puddle up and not emulsify, I'm just going to hang back for a second. And then as I see it, sort of, it was all incorporated. Now I'm moving on to the next part of it. And again, if I see that it was not emulsifying right in, I'm just hanging back. I think this is something really fun. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so, you know, you, you can definitely work on this with your kids. If they think it's fun, they might have fun making it. 
want nothing to do with your salad. That's a separate issue. But um, but it's a really fun sort of you know experience, and, and I think it's fun for them to see it emulsify. I think it's fun for them to see the oil disappear. Hopefully, you're getting a pretty good angle. Talents, can you kind of see the bottom of the bowl? Yeah, I can, Tony. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, good. And so it you know it if it feels like a lot of oil hang back, you know, taste it. It might, it might seem like it's a lot of oil and then you taste it and this might taste like lemon. And, uh, and then you're like, oh, just kidding, I need to add more oil. So I'm just sort of going slowly here. I'm not the most patient person on this call tonight, so you might see me sort of start to go big at the end. Speaking of the pancakes, we always make these cute little pancakes on the weekend. And then I'm always just sort of over it by the end. And the last thing I do is just this monster pancake to use all the batter, because <laughs> I'm just totally over it. So, uh, uh, you know, patience is a virtue when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, but actually, well, I'll whisk this in, and then I'll stop. And you can see there, there's a lot going on in here. I have some raw garlic pieces. I have lemon zest. I have parsley. I have all of the grains from the mustard. So there, there are a lot of things going on in here. But what you don't really see is a big mix of like oil on one side and, and vinegar on the other side. It's pretty well, um, it's pretty well incorporated. Um, you can definitely do this with a, with a. You know, like a Cuisinart or any of these different um, machine tools, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, I think if you put too much, um, if you put too much mustard, I think, and and the power of that machine, I think it, it might get pretty pasty. It might not not quite like mayonnaise, but it would certainly, but um, but it would get pretty pasty. So that's something I would be aware of. And that's pretty much it. I don't think I need all this oil. Now this is where I'll taste it and find out that it's a, a lemon. That's getting that's perfect. Okay, so there you go. That is that has a ton of flavor. That's really nice. So I have some chili flakes out. But for me, I would I would put some of those in up to your taste, of course. And that is that. Tony, yeah. while you're doing that, I've got a, a good question for you. Yep. As some people may know, some people may not, but I figured it would be a good one for you. Yep. What does emulsifying mean? Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, you're basically just, you're, you're just sort of uh, making it a harmonious, you know, there, there's some science behind it that would be, you know, the next time we do this, we'll do it. We'll do the science version of all this. Um, you know, it's basically just bringing it all together. So it's like, like mayonnaise is an emulsified sauce. And so egg yolk is one of the reasons that it is emulsifying, that egg yolk is even more of a binder or an emulsifier than the mustard is. Um, though there is Dij in like homemade mayonnaise, there's Dijon also. Um, yeah, so it's basically, um, it's just bringing it all together into more of a, I mean, this is not like mayonnaise, certainly, but just a harmonious kind of sauce. And mayonnaise, I think, is really underrated. I think, um, uh, I think homemade mayonnaise is fantastic. And, uh, you, you know, uh, you hear people talking a lot about aioli. Uh, aioli is uh, fancy mayonnaise with garlic, basically. Um, you can make uh, caper aioli. We make this really great um, roasted jalapeno and honey uh, aioli. Uh, that we use in some different things that work. So that's really good. Um, this can live in a mason jar in your uh, refrigerator and you can just, you know, the, the emulsification will sort of break eventually. Um, you can just sort of shake it up and use it for up to a week, which is pretty cool. Uh, what else do I want to show you? Glad to answer any other questions. Um, one thing that I do want to show you is I made, I made a very kid-friendly version. Uh, of the flatbread before we got on the call. Oh, I step out of the way here. Uh, so this one was um, just the mozzarella, the tomato basil, um, chicken, some roasted chicken, and then a little more, because I always like that, is, that cheese is the insurance policy over the top, um, a little more cheese and uh, mozzarella and Parmesan. Um, and this was in my 475 degree oven on a pizza stone for every bit of 15 minutes. I actually turned it halfway um, just to make sure I sort of got it nice and browned. Um, and uh, I think this is the winner. Um, that's actually a good, I think, ooh, we've probably been about 12 or 13 minutes since I put mine in the oven. So I can check it to see what shape we're in. Nice. Any questions while I'm pulling that out? I think we did get one in the chat where 
um, one of our uh, guests had mentioned he wants the the recipe for the, the oh, Tony's dough. dough. Yeah. Yeah, really. Ah, that's a hard angle. Let me see if I can get it here. Can you guys see that okay? That one's good. Nice. So I'm going to check the bottom of this just to make sure it's as done as I want it. Yeah, this is plenty done for me. So, so you know, I, I just hope this inspires you guys to spend more time in the kitchen for sure. Um, I'm all about supporting small businesses and restaurants right now with what's going on. So do that. Keep doing that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, you can kind of next level what you're doing at home too. strike a balance in that regard. Um, I think the infused oils are really fun. Um, I think uh, being safe with the knives <laughs> is, is uh, crucially important. Um, and yeah, just don't take it. Too, I just, life's too short. Don't, don't take all this stuff too seriously. Uh, we want to thank Tony for uh, doing this for us. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't be cooking at the same time and hosting, right. so I had to. <laughs> so now I'm going to go to the kitchen and start uh, making well, my dish. So, so thanks, tell, Tony. Just tell them we're next door neighbors. Just tell them that I'm going to get over. I'll be there. Yeah. Um, we also want to share uh, for our members, we have a lot. There's a slide that we just pulled up. Thank you, Deanna. Um, just to remind you of the member benefits that you get. Um, so Tony's been a great partner for us, and he offers our members 10% off. The culinary kits that some people, some of the members had already ordered for tonight. Once again, you can use your the tech member uh, promo code, and you can get ten percent off your order. You can, can I order. Tell about Tony. The, can I tell them about Tony's to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we're doing a kind of a gourmet comfort food concept. So um, the way we've structured our program is um, Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, you that's available for purchase um, to use for the next week. So Tuesday through Sunday, you can go online. Well, Tuesday night through Sunday. And then you can see everything that we have queued up for the next week. Uh, we're selling it uh, all cooked and ready to go. Uh, but we also have some of these fun activity kits like a salsa experience, a chocolate lava cake, all these different fun things. Um, but for the most part, it's all cooked, ready to go in portions of four. Uh, and so you order that through Sunday night and then we'll cook it the next week. And then on Tuesday of every week, um, so after you know the orders close on Sunday, on Tuesday of every week, you can either pick it up from our kitchen, we're a couple miles from Levi Stadium, uh, or we can deliver to your house. And we have the 10% off for tech members and that's ongoing. It's gonna be a fun program. Thanks, Tony. So we're just gonna stick around just for a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. I did see uh, a few thank yous from the people that attended. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy calendar. Um, we know there's a thousand things you could have done um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come to the kitchen as a family and, uh, and cook with us. We, we really, really hope you enjoyed it. Um, on this slide, we also have a couple of activities that we also have coming up. Uh, please uh, take a minute to check these out. Our virtual summer camp activities, you can just go to our website uh, and just, just look at the options that are available. You can participate in any of our design challenges. Uh, for those that do, you can get a free tote. Uh, in addition, uh, on August 6th, save that date. That's our next members only webinar. And that will be on the topic of creating exhibitions, a behind the scenes look um, at that. So we hope that once again, you'll take advantage of that. Uh, we really do wanna send a heartfelt thank you to our members. Uh, we couldn't do anything at the tech without you. We really appreciate you taking the time to be members, but also take uh, part in this activity. Once again, we'll keep these activities rolling all, as well as other things uh, as well. Um, just looking through, making sure we don't have any missed questions. I did see, Tony, that somebody wants that recipe. So yep. don't forget to, to, to post the, the Tony's family secret okay. recipe for dough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sicilian grandma's recipe. Yes, I'm on it. <laughs> it's always the secret grandma's recipe. Exactly. It was secret until now. <laughs> <laughs> now we all know. Yeah. Uh, I do see a question that came through from Marin. Thank you, Marin. It says, how long do we cook it for? And I'm guessing she's talking about flatbread, not something else. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, your, your Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, 15 minutes, I think. You, I mean, every oven's going to be different. I don't know if you went to 475. I would say 15 minutes is a good rule of thumb, and I'd recommend turning it halfway. Um, the other thing you can do, if you feel like it's probably cooked through, but it's not what you want on the top, you could, um, you could turn your broil around for a second. I would not walk away. Uh, you might even put it on a big plate or spatula and like lift it up. So it's right, sort of right under that broiler. If you feel like it's cooked, especially if you're on a pizza stone, right? Cause you'll cook through really well on the bottom, but then maybe the top's not what you want. So that's a good trick. But I'd say 15 minutes is a good rule of thumb. 
and I'll put mine, the one that just came out of the oven, I'll put it back under there. This was fun. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Tony. Once again, I, I'm just checking just for a minute, for one more minute to see if we get any other questions. Once again, I do see a lot of thank yous. So thank you for the thank yous. <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, I think I'll actually, uh, I'll snap some photos of what I just took out of the oven. I'll put it on my social media. So at Tony Caters on Instagram, Facebook, uh, if you want to see, connect the dots to what we just did. I see a lot of inspired chefs out there. Nice. Lola is on her. Lola. <laughs> Lola, you still there? Are you over us? Oh, there she, there she is. I hope everyone actually, um, hope everyone was actually able to follow along pretty well. Um, I, I saw a lot of great pictures, Tony. Oh, good. Myself, oh, myself and Deanna, we were watching what was being made and. Good. That's a